Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's episode is based on the Bursus, Opus 57 by Frédéric Chopin. This wonderful and beloved piece um, was written uh, between 1843 and 1844. It was first published in Paris in 1844. Before we get started with the tutorial section of today's video, I thought I'd go ahead and play the first two pages of this, which in this edition, is uh, the Ecker edition, the Chopin National Edition, is the first 26 bars of the piece. Concludes the first 26 bars. We will get through the entire piece in this tutorial, but I thought that we would just start with that. I've been playing this piece fairly seriously for about four to five weeks now. I read through it several times um, last fall and uh, early winter, uh, but it wasn't until I finished a performance of the Bach Busoni Chacon um, on January 7th that I was working like crazy for that I picked this up and started to learn it and memorize it and get it ready for a couple of performances that I gave about a week and a half ago just uh, to some elementary school kids. Uh, sponsored by the Gina Bachauer Foundation. They do a great job of community outreach. Um, so that was a lot of fun to play this for the first time uh, about 10 days ago or so. This piece uh, was originally written as a set of variations in D-flat major. Uh, Chopin just called them variant. Um, so, uh, and later it, w it became Bersus or lullaby. Um, so this is written uh, as 16 variations on an ostinato ground bass. So we want to keep that in mind as we go through this. You're going to hear all sorts of different interpretations, uh, which is obviously why we all play music. It's so beautiful. Everyone has their own um, interpretation and things to say with their interpretation. You'll hear some that are very tranquil and meditative. I think it was Solomon uh, Kuttner, I believe. I, I'm not sure how you pronounced his last name, but he has a very meditative recording. Rubinstein's is a bit more quick. Same thing with Ignaz Friedman. There was one recording that like every single note was displaced. I think it was Michelangelo. Obviously, I always love listening to Courteau. He's so original. Um, so I've learned a lot by listening to those recordings, and I want to shed some light on some things that I've personally discovered as I've worked um, on this piece. We'll be going over things like fingering, interpretation, voicing, um, different shapes that you can do with different variations, how to, uh, you know, 
navigate some of those trickier passages or this. I have some unique fingering that I came up with that seems to really help me and also kind of helps to shape the thirds very naturally in groups of three, so I hope that will help. Uh, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that I always like to do is make sure that I start with enough momentum. So I like to play fairly flat. It's really easy to kind of settle in on this and then be like, oh shoot, I gotta get up here, and then you might accent it. So as I come down, it's it's there's so many instances of similarity uh, between this and the D-flat nocturne, uh, starting low and having to come up at the end. Uh, how does this go? That is so similar to the D-flat nocturne, so you can see some um, similarities between those. But go ahead and start with some momentum. And then I take the time there and breathe. I, I think it's very unattractive to go two, three, four, five, six, one. And students <laughs> tend sometimes to rush the point of rest. So this is very legato. Chopin writes uh, slurs over them, signifying the legato. That's your resting point. And it's just my personal opinion that that should resolve to there. Then you can pick it up. Because a lot of interpretations you'll hear. It's kind of strong two in a row. I like this to come up here. Also coincides with the pedal. You can uh, refer to my pedal camera um, on this screen uh, for reference to all of my pedal changes, but that pedal change, as we change harmonies, so D flat to A flat seven, it, it thins out the texture. So I don't like to crash into it to like that. So then you can reemerge. The, also, the momentum is static in the melody, so it kind of comes to a resting point and then it gains some energy. Okay, I, I'd also talked about uh, being a little flatter. You can feel free to stroke back slightly. You're not seeing me stroke back every single key, but I, I am feeling kind of like I'm taking those keys. to there, then diminuendo to there, okay? Now, um, I'll use a lot of substitute fingering in this uh, piece. So, one, three to one, two, three, five. So if that's a new concept to you, fine. Um, four, one, five, three, two, one, three, two, four. Five one four one three two five one four one three two four one five one three two five one and then I personally use three one and then three two four one five one so you're seeing even though this is going to be in the pedal and the pedal will connect things for you I still want to make as much connection as I can in the hand it will help you to naturally fill those connections and make a smoother legato. Also be careful, this first line is a single line. When we get to bar seven, we introduce an alto line. So I guess it's the upbeat two seven. Make sure to keep this alto line much softer. As I've said in many videos about voicing on my channel and many different pro practice tutorials, my favorite voicing exercise is something I learned from Susan Duelmeyer when I was nine years old or 10 years old. We were playing the... That was my first Chopin etude. I think I was 10 or maybe 11 even. Um, and we did this exercise. 
where we would play staccato and soft on the non-melody note and loud and legato. It just, it, it really does work magic. I had a student doing some ch um, Schmidt exercises, you know, the other week and they would, or, and I had him do the voicing exercise. And I said, okay, now play it legato. After one week of only doing that exercise, He's like, oh my gosh, this is magic. I can suddenly play my melodies louder than my accompaniment. This is amazing. It just happened. Um, and it was a cool moment. And it, this is the same thing you want. And that exercise will definitely help you. So right there is a, is a perfect example, students will often hit that. It's a down stem. It's part of the alto line. So look at your stemming. That will show you where your melody and where your accompaniment is when you have those two simultaneous lines going on. All right, moving on. Again, I like to match, then allow the momentum. It's almost like a ball is suspended in air. There, and then it starts to fall. Da -tee, da -da -da. This will also help your phrases to be a little bit more round because you look at this phrase marking by Chopin, bar four, uh, sorry, three through the beginning of 15 is one long phrase marking. What are you supposed to do? There are miniature phrases within this. So feel free, and there's even smaller miniature phrases within those smaller phrases. So this. That could be thought of as one of the miniature phrases. Even within this, that's a little phrase then. This comes to rest here and then it regains momentum. So I wanna kind of just allude to those things and point them out occasionally just to get you thinking in terms of many layers with your shaping. Okay, this is not an easy piece, by the way. People think lullaby, and yeah, there are some uh, technical things in here, but don't take this too lightly. This is definitely an advanced piece, um, and it's something that you uh, have to craft very carefully. I'll always remember the Mendelssohn Serious Variations, Opus 54. The hardest part of that entire piece is... the theme. And you might think, oh, brother, whatever, uh, you know, but it really is to get all the layers perfectly and to get each of those falling figures to shape the correct way is very difficult. And it's the same thing with this. Make sure that you carefully craft these. I come to a rest there and I lift the hand and then I then think there and to there and to there and to there. And I'm thinking four distinct levels. So the top one. So this is level four. You don't need to be too loud on it, but it definitely just a little bit of time on those. And you don't want to take the same amount of time on every one of them. I guess it's five distinct levels, excuse me. So level five, that was too loud. Level four, level three, level two, then down to level one. Another way that you could think about this, uh,